order for Thursday, December 9th of 2021. May I have a roll call, please? Jeffrey Byer. Here. John Brown. Here. Scott West. Here. Leon Davis. Craig Bowman. Here. David Randolph. Here. Carol Mendon. Here. Before I ask for, before I move on to official business, I just want to remind everybody of what the, the screen is showing for the guidelines for a public hearing since the majority of the agenda tonight is for the public hearing. Uh, please keep in mind that the uh, reading of the agenda will be done by myself, the chair, and they'll be opening up to, a, 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 there'll be a staff presentation and then there's a question and answer from the planning commission. There's no specific time limit on that particular item. And then the application presentation, if the applicant is here, which is limited to 10 minutes, the speaker will be notified when the time is expired. The presentation is limited to the agenda item as presented on the agenda. There'll be a question and answer from the planning commission of which there's no specific time limit. And then the, the floor will be open for public, con, uh, co public comment. Online meeting guidelines re regarding the reading of the questions presented of the email if anyone sent them in. The questions will be read by staff, the questions to be received by the date established in the public notice, and it will be limited to three minutes per email. The citizen questions and comments will be allowed, but before the citizens are, are called to order, please make sure that if you do want to speak on behalf of any of the agenda items tonight, I will need you to sign in. There's a sign-in sheet at the back of the room, so please sign in if you want to be, um, if you want to speak. Uh, the questions, the citizen questions will, will be directed to the Planning Commission, which is us sitting up here. It will be limited to three minutes speaking time. The Planning Commission reserves the right to allow for more time if necessary. The speaker will be notified when the time is expired. The public comment is limited to the agenda item as presented on the agenda, and that's all it. Then the floor will be closed, and the applicant will be given an amount of time to respond, which is limited to 10 minutes. The speaker will be notified when that time has expired, and then the presentation again is limited to the agenda items as presented on the agenda. And then as the chair, I will call for a motion. Okay, with that being said, may I have a motion for approval of items one of one A through D on our agenda? Should we call that? Yes. Hmm? We call that? Yes. Yeah. Motion to approve the consent agenda. Second. Jeffrey Byer? Yes. John Brown? Yes. Scott West? Yes. Craig Bowman? Yes. Dave Randolph? Yes. Bowman? Yes. The, third, uh, the first item of business on the agenda is JZ21 PUD 132. It's a request by Ryan McCarty for approval of a zone change to commercial general and a planned unit development allowed for a mixed office use of office, warehousing, and storage. This is the location north of fire station number two, just off of 121st Street. Marseille. Thank you, Madam Chairman and Planning Commissioners. This is an item that um, we've talked about multiple times in the past year, or at least the general area and the property owned by Mr. Um, Kevin. And the item before you today is what we lot split earlier in this year and he's come back with a PUD a planned unit development with some changes in the underlying zoning so the old comprehensive plan had identified this as industrial and um, I don't know if you remember but when they went to do the lot split they didn't realize that it was not zoned at that time it was still agriculture so in keeping with their plans and with the um, with the zoning requirements they're here tonight it's basically 21 plus acres and it's a mix of uses it's called a horizontal mixed use so basically we're, there, there's not multiple floors but it's um, one large parcel that has multiple development areas and within those development areas we have general restrictions so if you look at page <clears throat> 34 of your packet it talks about um, the residential properties to the north would be buffered by a large dedicated reserve area and there's a proposed detention pond on the side that separates the western properties with some green space so what i did in the chart that follows normally when i prepare your packets i try to show you if this um, zoning did not change these uses would be allowed 
if it was changed to this zoning, this is what can be allowed now, and this is what the PUD is requesting. In this case, I added a new column, and <laughs> this is what the new UDO would allow. So in this chart, we have what does commercial general look like as it exists today, what does commercial heavy look like, what does IL look like, IM, and then um, the new UDO. So essentially, there are four development areas. There's development area A, C, or A, B, C, and D. But um, if you go through the chart in the new UDO, which we'll talk about later, we will not have a use unit called off-street parking. So that would not be even an option. And then um, professional offices would be equivalent to what you would see um, in use unit 11. And they're proposing to allow for offices in development area A and C. Then if you look at use unit 13 as it exists today, that would be considered general retail in the new UDO, general services, brewery, coffee, et cetera. And that is um, requested uses within development area C. If you look at um, development area B and D, they're asking for use unit 15, which would be allowed in CG, CH, IL, and IEM, and it's um, allowed in the new UDO as self-storage. If you look at use unit 19, and our code as it is written today, and this was common, um, I was explaining to Jackie earlier, basically Tulsa adopted a code years and years and years ago, all the surrounding municipalities stole it, took it for their own, which was fine. And um, the only real place that allowed for entertainment was under hotel motel. And it was more like, I mean, unless it was an, an outdoor arena or something like that. But if you wanted to have a, a bar or a lounge or a, um, a swimming, like a commercial swimming pool or something like that, it was really generally found in use unit 19. But in the new code, it would be under general entertainment, so it would be different. Um, and then use unit 24 and 22. So one of the changes um, that they are requesting is to have office warehouse. And we've talked about that for several months now, knowing that um, with COVID, things have changed dramatically, how people do business, how they um, operate their business. They need an office space, but they also need space to store their wares. So that they can get them out the door quicker they can um, store them up as you know you don't want them to be stuck on some shipping container once you get them off you definitely want to have control of what happens to them next so office warehouse is something that's changed a lot in in how we do business but it's also something that's really um, become very relevant in um, in doing business some of the prohibited uses are sexually oriented businesses and medical marijuana. So then if you go down, development area A is about 6.8% of the development, and that's what would be dedicated to office slash studio. Development area B is for uh, dedicated for RV storage, and that one is about 6% of the development. Development area C, which is identified as mixed use, and a lot of times when you say mixed use, people think of uh, residential with um, office or retail, but in this case, we're talking about office, warehouse, and retail. Uh, one I'd like to highlight is development area D. I did have a citizen uh, talk to me about this one, and uh, I apologize. We've been very busy with the new UDO, so I haven't had a chance to speak to the applicant, and they are, they'll be able to explain to you. We've called this um, multiple things. <laughs> so in the PUD application, as you see, they narrowed it down to garage condos. But if you remember, this was an industrial property and there is a deed restriction and you can never have anything domiciled. So you can't have it, you can't live there, you can't um, be domiciled. <clears throat> and that is per the Corporation Commission. It will be part of the plat language, I am sure. So one of the things that the citizen said, please change that. So I spent 15 minutes today thinking about what in the world it could be called that would maybe project what they want to do. So this is um, my she shed, uh, and it is, Carol and I are gonna have a she shed there, whereas you all may have a man cave, if that helps you understand what this is, the purpose of this. 
So I need a place to hang out and do my uh, cricket. And um, Carol needs a place to store all of her dog stuff that she's working on. And um, so I don't think it should be called man caves because that would be a little sexist. Maybe not she sheds and then it's too complicated. So they said garage condos. We're going to ask them to take condos completely out of it because that implies that you could stay the night there. And God forbid you may not stay the night in your man cave. It's not allowed. So we'll, we'll revisit that language. Um, and this is a surprise to the applicant, sorry. Uh, development area E, which is the reserve area and drainage, is about 35% of the development, which is actually really nice. So 35% of this will stay open space. And um, <clears throat> I'm sure they would like to develop every inch of it. But fortunately for the city of Jinx, <laughs> there's a lot of encumbrances on this land, and they will not be able to. If you look at... Um, there's just some general comments and the evaluation. I think that they did a really good job in the overall design of the entire parcel and really keeping that green space and and cre creating uses that maybe you can't find everywhere but are actually needed. So there's about seven things listed under the recommendations. Staff does recommend conditional approval, but I would also add um, to my recommendation. So when you one of you will make a recommendation this evening. Um, and if you say per staff recommendation, it would include to uh, change the garage condo title to something else. And it would also include adding the language of equivalent to what the deed restriction says. And it says not domiciled something. So it would just be in there in the PUD. That being said, you can turn to page 39 have the table of contents for the actual planned unit development. Um, page 42 shows the general outline looking at a Google Earth view. On page 44, you're going to see the site plan and how they're laying it out. Page 45 is the actual current zoning. So you can see it's primarily ag. And then we had rezoned that front portion where there is going to be an office and then the RV storage, the proposed zoning map. Um, the applicant says called the zoning um, PUD zoning, and that is fine. But underneath that, there is office. There would be commercial general, and we'll leave the recreation and open spaces ag. The exhibit F on page 47 shows that this has been amended. So they came through um, back when they did the rezoning for the lot split. We changed and amended the, the future land use map to allow for um, business park. So that's what you see. It will be changed um, at the end of this year on our map. So they have another exhibit from the comprehensive plan. And then you see some building elevations and concepts. Um, their signage, uh, more of a monument sign that's kind of a statement piece. It's not your traditional narrow tall, or you know narrow sign. And then you have on page 51 the vehicular access and circulation. This has been reviewed at length with the public safety, fire department, and engineering staff. There's a lot of steps, as you know, once you approve a planned unit development, it's definitely not the end of the story, it's the beginning of the story. So just keeping that in mind, on page 52, you'll see the actual development areas. And I believe development A is under development with that office, is that correct? Being permitted, Being permitted right now. Um, then if you go through, it tells the actual uh, standards established for each district and staff comments within those um, districts shows the lot split on page 62 I included the special warranty deed and I will read um, it says there are restrictions in in I it says to not allow the property to be used for residential purposes it is it being the expressed intent of the parties that the property will be used for industrial or commercial uses only, and that at no time will any persons be domiciled or otherwise reside on the property. And it, it does go on to talk about what does that mean. 
So that is all that I have as a staff report. If you have any questions, I'll be happy to try and answer them. The owner and the applicant and um, are present to answer questions as well. Okay. Commissioners, any questions? Was, was there any public comment for this that you received? I did not receive any. I feel like Brandon received one phone call from someone adjacent maybe on the um, west, and it was really just an inquiry of what was taking place, and there were no comments. You'll have to wait to have public comment on this. Any other questions from the commissioners? Yeah, I had uh, just a couple of quick questions. Um, and you already addressed the definition of domicile mm -hmm. and the special warranty deed because there was kind of a question in my mind. Since this was previously used for oil and gas, what's the environmental concerns of staying overnight versus somebody working in their office for 12 or 14 hours, but it's the groundwater from what I understand. Right. I, I did have a question that I, when I look back on this, I could not find if this site had been used for active wells, uh, and I didn't know any cap locations, because I would still have the question of whether or not a building is being constructed over a capped well. That uh, is part of the exploration process during the planning. Okay. And they okay. should find out from the Corporation Commission any of those locations, and that would be identified at that time and dealt okay. with through the Corporation Commission. That's all I have. Anyone else? Would the applicant like to come forward and speak? You're welcome to. If you come forward and give us your name and phone and name and address, please. Good evening. Ryan McCarty was the light design. Um, Marce, thank you for uh, the detailed description of the project. Um, she pretty much summed up all the nuts and bolts of it. We're pretty excited about this project. We've worked through I don't know how many iterations of trying to figure out all the pipelines and easements and restrictions and odd geometry on this to finally come up with a plan that uh, our client uh, will work well to him. It, it looks like there's a lot going on. If you look at the site plan, there's actually only nine total lots and there's a lot of buildings attached to the garage, whatever we call them, as we move forward. Um, but that is development area D is one lot and that'll all be controlled by one person. So, um, as far as we're, we're just trying to find something to put here that works well with the neighborhoods. We've got a lot of residential around here. This particular piece of ground was in the old comp land deemed industrial, and my client purchased the property with the idea of it being staying industrial. A new comp plan came out, so we we pivoted a little bit and brought in some of the business park um, concepts, a little more commercial. We tried to get a little bit of office warehouse in there based on the original IL um, ideology or the industrial ideology. So um, I'll be glad to answer any questions you guys may have, specific questions. Any questions for Ryan? Okay, thank you, Ryan. We'll see if the audience. Thank you, guys. At this point, I'll open the floor to the audience. Does anyone in the audience wish to speak on behalf of this agenda item? That? Okay, close the floor. Anything else from the commissioners, or do I hear a motion? Just, just a comment. Uh, I think this looks like a neat development. I, I think Jenks needs more of these kind of garage, whatever you want to call it. I actually have a, a friend who had to open a similar business in Sepulpa but would have loved to have had something like this in Jinx. So um, looks like a new project. So okay. I also think it's not a disturbance to neighborhoods nearby. If there could be things that were a lot would be a lot worse. So um, I guess I'm a fan. Thanks. Can we have a motion? <clears throat> I think motion to approve agenda item number three, I believe it is, with some uh, staff recommendations. I'll second. 
Jacob Byer? Yes. John Brown? Yes. Scott West? Yes. Greg Bowman? Yes. Dave Randolph? Yes. Chairman? Yes. Next item on the agenda is JZ21 PUD 133. Request by J.R. Donaldson for approval of his own change to residential multifamily medium density and a planned unit development. General location is at 504 East B Street. Marseille? Thank you, Madam Chairman and Planning Commission. This is a, um, a new project in the downtown, a request for a new project, and it would be a townhome project. And we are um, looking at the southeast corner of 5th and B Street. The um, applicant is Mr. J.R. Donaldson. He is present. So if I do not answer all your questions or provide all the information you're looking for, he'll be able to answer those. I'm going to say in advance when I reread this today, uh, there are a lot of grammatical errors. So if you read it word for word, you may have been appalled. <laughs> and I apologize for that. I will get those corrected before we go to plan city council. So sorry. The um, On page 67 of your packet, we had at least two persons call uh, that were interested in the information from the public. They didn't have any objections. They didn't state any objections. They may have some, but they did not state them to staff. The On page 68 is the chart that we referred to in the other case. And um, you can see if the, the property is currently zoned RS2, and then you have the comparison with PUD 133 versus townhome versus RM2. So in this case, they asked for RM2 so that they get could get higher density, but it's still a townhouse project. So it's just a little more dense. There is one, um, I believe, an error. If you look at residential collector streets and the setback where it says PUD 35, that is not correct. I'll have to ask Mr. Donaldson to um, state what that is. So basically it's lots four through 12 of block 10 and this is the original town jinx the lots are currently vacant if you zoom in on google earth it looks like there's still a house there but there there's not a home there the um, zoning map is seen on page 69 and i have it outlined in yellow you can see kind of the general area it's got some multifamily to the south and it has the um I think it's 523 townhomes, which is PUD 102 up across the street on the uh, north side there. It is um, recommended by the future land use plan in the comprehensive plan to have a higher density in that area. Where when um, House Hill Levine was here collecting public input on the city of Jinx, one of the things that was um, very important to the public and mm -hmm. affirmed by the staff and then adopted through the the um, comprehensive plan was to have that higher higher density in the downtown. So people want a more connected, walkable area. They want to, we would like to create an environment where you can live and work and ultimately play some um, entertainment and different things like that. So this feels like a good fit. On page 71, uh, I have the recommendations that will be replatted and um, they'll be using the alley. So they'll need to improve that per city specifications. And that would just be working that out with the city engineer. And there are a couple of other comments. <clears throat> if you turn the page to 72 starts the actual planned unit development. On page 75, you see the actual layout of, of what is being proposed. So in line with what House Hill Levine has recommended, there is no parking on 5th Street or on B. In this case, it's all adjacent to the alley, and that is the preference for future development. If you look on page 77 is a project map. Oh, is it, does it have, um, I'm sorry, I forgot. It does have, yes, thank you. It has um, parallel parking, sorry. Yes, so parallel parking parking rather than angled parking along B Street. <clears throat> if you look on page 78 is the actual original plat, and then um, you have some additional exhibits that show the topography and um, the proposed rezoning. 
if you look on page 82, they're showing a sample of what the elevations might look like. This is kind of a modern um, masonry style building. Looks like a traditional brownstone. These, um, the applicant is representing a client who I believe has done some similar projects in the Rose District in Broken Arrow. Very nice product. On page 83 is that same code um, table that we looked at earlier. And then um, on page 84 is the breakdown of that. And then on page 85, talking of just general requirements of the PUD. And I think that is it from the staff perspective. Do you have any questions? And I apologize, there is um, parallel parking on B Street, I believe. So a couple questions. The, uh, the proposed layout shows uh, 18 units, but I didn't actually see that reduced to writing in the document. So I don't know if that we're going to hold to that. I also didn't notice uh, we've got a lot size, but uh, livable square footage in the unit. So that's mm -hmm. been identified. It has not. Okay. I do have I do have some concerns about the on-street parking um, simply because of the traffic flow on B. Mm -hmm. um, that could present some problems. Somebody's pulling out of a parking space because that's especially if it's going to be in 3.30 in the afternoon when school's out. Um, I, okay. That, there's been a lot of accidents at that intersection. So I don't know if there's any way to uh, address that. I'll, I'll defer to the applicant to see if they want to respond to that. Had two questions: the concerns about traffic on B Street, and what was the other one? Uh, this, what was the square footage on oh, the livable yes. space? Yes. And we don't have that calculation. I noted that too. Any other questions? No. If the applicant like to come forward, please give us your name and address. My name is J.R. Donaldson, 12820 South Memorial Drive in Bixby. I represent the uh, owner of the property and the uh, PUD that we're bringing before you, B Street Gardens, and the rezoning. Uh, we believe it's going to be a project that will be very uh, attractive in the Jinx area. As Marseille stated, we have three of these projects in Broken Arrow, and they've all turned out to be really uh, nice projects. Uh, with regards to the questions that uh, the commission had with regards to and Marseille, the uh, the setback is 31 feet from the center line of uh, B Street, and so uh, that allows us to have a six foot uh, building setback and utility easement, 25 foot to the right of way. Uh, the units are planned to be 1,800 square feet with the on street parking, 900 down, 900 up. Uh, the, the brownstone units, and so they're going to be nice units. The uh, we feel like that on the off-street parking, uh, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, with the traffic uh, flowing in both directions in front of the project, uh, and our parking will be such that our traffic will flow to the east, so they will not be there at that intersection. And the other thing that we'll be doing is right now there's a bar ditch, and so our parking will uh, basically remove the bar ditch by putting storm sewer in the ground, and so that's how we're going to be moving into the right of way. Um, the 18 units are what's proposed on this, uh, and I stated uh, 31 foot is our setback from the center line of uh, B Street, six foot uh, building line and utility easement. And I'd be happy to answer any of the questions that the uh, commission might have at this time with regards to this project. Any questions for Chair? John, does that answer your concerns? Yeah, I was just uh, counting parking spaces to see what's the number of spaces per unit. And maybe you have that. It's 24. 20, okay. 
So that'd be 34. Oh, yeah, I see that now. Okay. Yeah, with the 34 it's spaces, spaces between them to the alley, it gives us uh, quite a few spaces per week. Are they, how many bedrooms? Uh, Are they all different or is Right now, is it determined? Uh, they're going to be two and three bedroom units. I think that the, uh, the owner, he's going to, he's trying to determine that the percentage is split up right now, that two and three bedroom units. Any other questions? Exterior lighting. Uh, Any exterior lighting that would be on the buildings would be shielded so that the direct straight towards the ground. There'd be no tall lights, no signage. How about over the parking areas? Uh, right now, if there are uh, lights to be placed in the alley, it would be shielded, directed down because if we couldn't have it affect our uh, people living in our units just as the, on the other side of the alley. And as Marseille stated, we do have to upgrade and modify the alley. In this particular case, uh, uh, with regards to the fire protection, the alley has to be improved to 75,000 pound capacity to carry uh, fire trucks. So uh, it'll be constructed just as any other public street. Thank you. Thank you very much. Anyone at this point will open the floor. Does anyone in the audience wish to speak on behalf of this agenda item? Okay. Close the floor. Any last comments or may I hear a motion? I'll make a motion at 3 JC 21 BUD 133. Second. Jeffrey Byer? Yes. John Brown? Yes. Scott West? Yes. Craig Bowman? Yes. Dave Randolph? Yes. Thurman? Yes. Thank you, Mr. Donaldson. Next item on the agenda is a public hearing on the proposed adoption of the Unified Development Ordinance. I'll turn this over to Marseille. This is where we all take a really deep breath. <laughs> We've been working on this for a really long time. And um, I want to thank uh, Jackie Wells. She's here tonight representing House Seal Levine. And they were hired in 2000, a long time ago. It's been two. <laughs> I think it might, it was either the end of 18 or the beginning of 19. 18, I, I don't know, um, a couple of years ago. <clears throat> and they had um, two components to their contract. And the first one was to update the comprehensive plan and that includes the land use map. And then the second component was to um, update the zoning code. And as I mentioned earlier, our zoning code is basically um, from the 70s and then has been piecemealed over time to meet the expectations and the demands of the city of Jinx. So a lot of it was um, very untraditional because in the past, it, um, the city of Jinx, and to some degree still, um, liked the PUD process and wanted everything to go through that process for a lot of reasons, and they're very valid reasons. But that creates, um, for the city, 200-something zoning documents instead of one. Now, the good news is this cleans up a lot of that and streamlines a lot of that the bad news is I still have 200 something documents I have to deal with. <laughs> and moving forward, you can still do a PUD if, if you need to. So um, the subdivision regulations were added into the, so they're now codified into the zoning code. So that's a big change. But um, basically, I'm excited to get to this point. We are in the, the final draft version and if you have any comments, concerns, there is still time to address them. I hope that we'll be able to take this to city council in the second meeting in January. If there are a lot of concerns and we're not comfortable with that, it's your code. <laughs> take however long you need. <laughs> but as of right now, that is that is my goal as the, the planner. And um, 
<clears throat> I'm not going to say a whole lot more about it, but I would like to introduce Jackie. This is Jackie Wells, and she's primarily written it. This is her baby. I hope I get to know this baby really quickly <laughs> because reading it is not the same as owning it. I can tell you that much right now. So, Jackie, please come forward. <clears throat> It's so great to be back in front of you in person this time. I know we've met a few times virtually, but it's great to be, to be back here in Jenks. It's like Marseille said, we've been working on this project for quite some time now. As the um, conference plan got adopted, and we moved right into the zoning ordinance update. As we did the zoning ordinance and subdivision regulations, proposing to combine those into a unified development ordinance. That's really to make a one-stop shop for developers, for residents, for anyone interested in investing in Jenks. They really have that one location that they need to look for what they can and cannot do with any potential property. So we had some three main drivers to the UDO update. First, to align with the comprehensive plan of all of those recommendations uh, to how to meet the vision of the community uh, moving forward that was established by all of the public outreach that was conducted during the planning process. Our other goal was to make the code much more user friendly, make it so uh, residents, developers, anyone interested in investing in Jinx didn't have to go to Marseille, didn't have to go to Brandon, didn't have to call their lawyer uh, to know uh, what was possible within the code. Uh, so making it much more user friendly so a lay person would be able to understand uh, exactly what they could do. Our other driver was to modernize their standards. Uh, things really hadn't been updated comprehensively in a long time, so there were a lot of standards that were pretty outdated. Uh, so we are hoping uh, that this a package that, we, that you all have in front of you, uh, the November 17th draft of the UDO, uh, meets all of those goals. Um, and I just want to walk through a few of them with you. I have a copy of the boards in front of me. They're the boards that are all around the room. I hope you all do as well. So the first one we have is the proposed zoning districts. You'll notice that not a whole lot has changed uh, within the, the zoning map. Uh, we are proposing um, a few. I'm sorry, Jackie. You have more of the change on the zoning map are to the downtown and the riverfront area. Uh, so the conference of plan paid really special attention to these uh, two major areas of the community. They both <coughs> had their own uh, sub-area plan, so really detailed planning recommendations as to how to uh, really revitalize the downtown and uh, continue to develop the riverfront of the entertainment destination of the community. So to align with the comprehensive plan, we're proposing uh, that all of the downtown core that pink area shown on the major change map uh, that all be zoned to the downtown core district. Currently, uh, that area has several base zoning districts and then an overlay district. So to streamline everything and make it really clear uh, what you can and can't do uh, with your property, uh, we are proposing that you have just the one downtown core. Then we have the downtown transition overlay district. Um, so this is the um, overlay district that would apply to the uh, two blocks surrounding the downtown. Uh, this would allow for the types of uses that are there currently, a mix of retail uses, office uses, service uses, and residential uses, in a way that's really compatible with the scale of development in the neighborhood and then the, the surrounding residential areas. And then last but not least, we have the Riverfront Tourist Commercial District. Again, the Riverfront area is currently uh, zoned in multiple districts. Uh, so really wanting to streamline that. So we utilize the Riverfront Tourist Commercial Districts, and a majority of the property was already in that district. Uh, but we did make a lot of tweaks uh, to the underlying regulations uh, to better align with the comprehensive plan recommendations. Our next board is allowed uses. Um, so as you all know in your UDO, or in your zoning regulations currently, you have use units. Uh, so you have a table for each of your districts that identifies which use units are allowed, and then someone has to flip to chapter 10 to understand what the use units include. Um, so instead of all of that, we're proposing just to consolidate everything into these two tables. So we have our residential districts and our non-residential districts tables. And we are proposing to consolidate a lot of the hyper-specific uses that are included in your code currently. 
Uh, so things like a barber shop and a nail salon and a beauty parlor, all of those things would be consolidated into general services. And then we're differentiating those based on the scale of the development rather than the use type uh, so that the city is better able to regulate uh, the impacts of larger uh, buildings versus smaller ones. Then you'll also notice that there's a new um, number here in the tables. We have a C, that's for conditional uses. Uh, these are uses that um, are currently permitted uh, that we think could be um, could warrant an additional level of review, uh, but wouldn't necessarily require a, a specific use permit or a special exception. Uh, so these are things that would be approved administratively, it would just be a check to make sure that they're meeting all of the new regulations of the UDL. Our next table is our dimensional standards. Uh, so again, we have two tables, one for residential districts and one for non-residential districts. For the residential districts, the lot area and lot width minimum requirements, uh, there are some major changes made to these, and it is based off of a non-conformity analysis that was performed um, as a part of this process. So that looked at the lot area minimum requirements uh, that are in the current zoning regulation <coughs> and those to development that's on the ground now. And that revealed that a ton of property within Jinx uh, does not conform to your zoning district standards. And that's because they were uh, approved through the PUD process, so they're legal, um, but then it can be confusing for folks when they are looking at their zoning ordinance and um, seeing that, oh, it says my lot has to be 15,000 square feet, but I know it's only 10,000 square feet. What does that mean? What can I do? Um, so to make sure everyone is, is really clear, we're proposing that those underlying standards be updated uh, to reflect what's on the ground currently. And then for our non-residential districts, you'll notice we're introducing a front and exterior side yard maximum requirement in the downtown and in the riverfront tourism commercial district. And this is to help uh, create that pedestrian-oriented environment uh, that's envisioned in our comprehensive plan. And then on this board are several uh, graphics and diagrams that are included uh, throughout the UDO, but these help uh, to explain to people exactly what we mean by um, our front yard setback, our rear yard setback, how we measure those setbacks, measure lot width, et cetera. So really trying to make the code much more user friendly um, and ensure that everyone's able to understand all of these requirements. Next, we have our development standards. So this chapter includes off-street parking, driveways, landscaping, screening, um, outdoor lighting, visibility standards, et cetera. So standards that would apply to uh, uses or development regardless of the district that it's located in, uh, but primarily uh, non-residential uses. Um, so our first uh, category here that has a, a more change um, in it is the driveway standards. So to um, ensure that we have um, driveways that are sufficient in accommodating uh, residents' needs for, for parking their vehicles or recreation equipment, um, but also is safe for the community and ensures that uh, we don't have uh, safety concerns when uh, kids are running around the neighborhood or are biking in the street. So to address that, we have uh, the blue area and the top graphic. That would be where your driveway meets the property line. So you would have a limited width uh, that that could be so that you wouldn't have those visibility concerns. But then to ensure everyone has adequate space to access their garage and park their vehicles, we have the garage access drive. That's that purple area. So the width of that could be as wide as your garage, and it would taper back to the maximum width of the driveway. And then to accommodate even more um, parking for residents, we have the parking pad that's shown in yellow. That would be on the side of the, the garage if uh, the lot has enough space to accommodate it. It would still have a setback uh, from the property line, uh, but that's really meant to ensure that residents um, have that space that they need to park their, their equipment, their vehicles, but then it isn't a nuisance to their neighbors being in their yard or being in an area that it really isn't uh, meant to have that type of equipment parked. Next, we have our landscaping standards. Currently, the city does not have uh, city-wide landscaping requirements, so these would uh, be a pretty big change for the community moving forward. So this would apply to all uh, multifamily, non-residential, and mixed-use development. So the top graphic shows um, <coughs> the four landscape areas that would be required. So the first one is the building foundation area, then the parking area perimeter landscape zone, so that's where your parking lot meets the right of way your parking area interior landscape zone. That, um, we have two different options. Uh, one would be a higher standard if your parking lot is located between uh, your building and the right of way, and then a lesser standard if your building is at the right of way and your parking is located to the rear or to the side. So if your parking lot is less visible uh, from public areas, you don't have as much requirements for landscaping. 
Then the green area is the transition zone. This is where um, a lot of butts another lot. Um, and you would have higher standards for your transition zone landscape. If uh, your lot is commercial and the lot next door, the lot behind you is residential, uh, you'd have uh, lesser requirements if it's commercial next to commercial. Then last but not least on this board, we have screening requirements. Uh, so we're proposing uh, new screening requirements for dumpsters and recycling receptacles, uh, loading areas, uh, roof, wall, and ground mounted mechanical units. So on our next board, we have signage. So the sign ordinance needed to be fully updated uh, because of a Supreme Court decision that came down in 2015. Uh, so the Supreme Court clarified uh, with that decision that signed copies protected speech under the First Amendment. Uh, so any regulation that would require you to read the sign in order to enforce it would be a violation of the First Amendment. So in order to make uh, to take out all of those content specific standards within the code, we're really overhauling the whole thing. Uh, so that impacted uh, real estate signs and campaign election signs and garage sale signs and all of the different types of signs that would have different standards for how long they could be put out or how big they could be, but you would have to read the sign in order to enforce that. So that was mostly impactful on our temporary sign standards. Uh, so you'll notice we have uh, four uh, sign types here, the top four, wall-mounted and ground-mounted banners, feather signs and temporary window signs. Those would be the types of temporary signs that would only be allowed in your commercial districts and they would require a temporary sign permit. Our post signs and our yard signs, they would be allowed in all of our, our zoning districts in the city and they would not require a permit. So the yard signs would be things like um, a booster sign for the kids' football team, a um, campaign election sign, a, a garage sale sign, that type of thing. And post signs are more typically uh, your real estate signs. Then for permanent signs, uh, we're proposing some changes, uh, to, especially to your freestanding sign regulations. Uh, so currently, monument signs and pole and pylon signs, those are regulated under the same standards. We're proposing that those be broken out. So you have standards for single tenant monument signs, multi-tenant monument signs, and pole and pylon signs. So those are all separated. And then uh, new standards for wall signs, projecting signs, and awning and canopy signs. And then the chapter also includes a table that identifies exactly what sign type um, is allowed in one district to make that really user friendly. And last but not least, we have our comprehensive plan alignment board. So this just highlights four of the uh, changes that we are proposing in the UDO uh, to better align the regulations with the uh, recommendations of the comprehensive plan. So the first one, accessory dwelling units, these are often referred to as granny flats or mother-in-law suites, uh, carriage houses, that type of thing. It would be an additional uh, small uh, dwelling unit on a single family detached property. It could be located um, instead of a detached garage or in the second floor of the detached garage could be internal to the home itself so it could be maybe in the basement or in the attic space um, or it could be attached uh, to the, the primary dwelling <laughs> similar to any um, home addition um, there and then there would also be standards to ensure that from the right of way you really couldn't tell that it was there it really helps it to blend into the community um, as it is currently next we have our anti-monotony standards so this would have very base requirements, very basic requirements for uh, differentiating between uh, single family home uh, models in new subdivisions. Uh, so in the graphic, those uh, yellow squares, those would be houses that could have the same uh, design. All the other homes would have to have some differentiation, um, whether it be a different color shingles or one has shutters, one doesn't, different color um, siding, that type of thing. Next is cluster development. So a lot of the um, undeveloped area uh, remaining in Jinx is um, impacted by some environmental features, mainly floodplains, uh, wetlands, that type of thing. So things that make it really difficult to, to fully develop um, those uh, areas. Uh, so to ensure that people are still able to um, develop those areas and really um, get the, the return on that, uh, we're proposing to have uh, cluster development allowances so you could have smaller lots in exchange for the, the preservation of those um, environmental areas. And then last but not least, we have our legacy districts. So there are two um, uses that you have currently in the community that the land use plan does not envision uh, the city have moving forward. So that's our um, heavier industrial uses in your IM district and mobile homes. 
So those two districts were proposing the transition into a legacy district. So the uses that exist currently will continue uh, being legal. They can continue to invest in their property um, and, and continue on as long as they would like to, uh, but no other land within the city could be rezoned to those two districts. And commercial heavy. And the um, highway commercial district. Right. Commercial heavy. Commercial heavy. So I know that's a lot of information that I threw at you all at once, so I'd be happy to take um, any questions about anything on the boards or anything else um, in the video. Commissioners, do you have any questions for Jackie? Thank you. Very informative. Well, you can open it up to the public now. Now? Yeah. Oh, yeah, this, this is the public here. Okay. So at this point now, I'll open up to the floor. We have some people that signed up to speak on this agenda item. The first one is Rhonda Bender. If you wish to speak, can you give us your name and address, please? Well, actually, I have it for the record, so. wouldn't hurt. May I? Sure. Uh, give us your name and address first, please. Rhonda Bender, 6839 East 105th Street in Tulsa. Thank you. Remember, you're on a timer. I am here on behalf of the Ronald Paul Raglan family, and I grew up in the city of Jinx, and I like the improvements and believe the Riverfront District does have some upsides to the community. My parents were business owners in Jinx beginning in 1973, and I believe my dad helped improve the infrastructure in Jinx by selling parcels to Tulsa Teachers Credit Union, the Louis Center, and Walgreens. He was passionate about this town, and what passion caused him to see a need to donate land to the city of Jinx throughout the years. As I have dug through paperwork and documents, it appears beginning in 1999, or 93, he gave a street dedication as the city of Jinx termed it the new roadway, being a portion of the realigned Main Street approach to the new Jinx Bridge. I see donations, dedication of right away, purchased land between my mom and dad and the city of Jinx beginning in 1993 with more donations and agreements between the two parties in 1999, 2001, 2003, 2004, 2005, and 2012. And I've attached all of the deeds of dedication and all the information um, concerning that. I am here regarding the 395 acre lot, Ragland Plaza 1, that sits at the corner of Main and Knight Street, right when you drive over the bridge. This valuable piece of property is currently zoned Commercial General, and the current zone of CG in the current use allows me to use it for 28 separate uses. The proposed UDO draft shows my general commercial will be rezoned to an RTC, the Riverfront Tourist Commercial, and this zone narrows the scope of use significantly by over 50% increase in uses. With that new UDO, there's 13 categories, there's 98 uses, and my commercial general would stay with 80 uses, but being rezoned is going to take me down to 45 uses. It will make this parcel more difficult to sell. Additionally, it will depreciate the land significantly. I am here asking for the UDO to be amended and to remove this parcel from the Riverfront Rezoning District and leave it in its current CG zoning. Because of the loss of uses, because of the CD and RTC, I feel that this is a taking of the value from the family property. Again, I'm asking for the UDO to be amended to remove this parcel. Here's a list of just some of the base, uh, best case uses this land are being removed from selling. drive through restaurants, um, bagel shops, Panera Bread, drive through coffee shop like Black Rifle Coffee, drive through pharmacies, drive through automated teller machine, drive through bank teller, drive through restaurant, drive through car wash, automatic and manual, drive through oil change, outdoor activity and operation, winery, distillery, convenience stores, multi-tenant shopping, urgent care and hospital, bed and breakfast, motel, short-term rental, personal storage facility, veterinarian clinic, vehicle sales and rentals, warehouse office, and this is just a few. I'm being asked for your consideration to remove this parcel from the river so the RTC zone. Thank you, Ron. Thank you. Next we have Stephen Gray. I'd like 
like to defer to Matt Ernest to okay. speak for me. All right. <coughs> Good evening. My name is Matt Ernest. I live at 8623 South 86th Street East in Tulsa, Oklahoma. I am a real estate appraiser. I have been appraising in the state of Oklahoma and had a license in the state of Oklahoma since 1998. I am also talking, as Ms. Bettler did, on the Raglan piece of property. One of the issues that appraisers come into contact with is what we're talking about here today, and that is legal uses of the property. When a property is res restricted from a legal use, it can affect the value of the property. So I'd like for you to keep that in consideration when you're introducing or attempting to change the zoning on this property. I had some concerns as to if this property had been developed and then this zoning came in, whether that use could be a grandfathered use. Of course, this property is not currently developed, but this zoning would restrict the property from a potential highest and best use. My comments would mirror Ms. Bedner's. Thank you very much for your time. I'll take any questions that you might have. Thank you, Mr. Ernest. Next, I have Janet Harris. Do we have Mr. Gray, please? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm terrible. Sorry. Me, I'm sorry. <laughs> Good evening. My name is Stephen Gregg. My address, uh, my office is 2400 West Detroit, Broken Arrow, Oklahoma, 74012. I am a licensed attorney in the state of Oklahoma, and I have been a city attorney and handled many municipal uh, matters, and I've also specialized in zoning as well as eminent domain. I want to reiterate or reflect on what the first speaker said. This is going to uh, in my opinion, have an adverse impact on her property. And all I'm asking, uh, and I want to reiterate what she said, is just carve out an exception on this point, 95 acre piece of land. There is nothing set in stone on zoning that matters or on zoning amendments. Uh, it's your all's call as to what's in the best interest of the city of Jinx. Here you have a family that have been cheerleaders for the city of Jinx for over 30 years and have done and given a great deal of property, uh, street dedications, easement dedications at no cost to the city of Jinx. All we're asking for is mercy with regard to this particular piece of property. Uh, I would, uh, some of the information that uh, Mrs. Bender has sh shared with you shows that uh, a broker's opinion of value, this property has been reduced in half if this zoning change goes through with the RTC uh, zoning uh, that you're having before you. All I'm asking is, again, have mercy and just uh, have compassion on people that have been very good to the city of Jinx. Uh, it's a business decision that you all have to make with regard to zoning, but that's why we're asking. Uh, zoning is a political decision of give and take. And so we're just asking if you could give and carve them out, I would appreciate it. Otherwise, it's going to, uh, if this goes forward to the city council, we'll be presenting these arguments again. If the city council uh, approves it, it's going to leave my client or clients in a difficult position as to whether or not to consider this a regulatory taking against the city of Jinx. And I would hate to see uh, a disruption of a positive family relationship with the city of Jinx. I'll be happy to make, uh, take any questions if you have them. Thank you, Mr. Gray. Next, we have Janet Harris. My name is Janet Harris. 
I'm here to get my street name changed. I live on East E. After 10 years of living there, I still don't know if I live on street or avenue. Please be open-minded in what I'm about to say. You just don't realize how many times a day you are required to state your home address. It's a lot when you just don't want to go through it all again. Each and every time it is a two to three minute hassle. People do not understand this address. They ask over and over, E, E, that is two E's, or do I just say E? They say something about that address just, just doesn't sound right. Are you sure? Then we have, you know, that it's confusing and difficult for delivery drivers. We need to update Jinx just because back in 1920 or whenever it was they came up with that name doesn't mean that because maybe that was wrong, it could have been right at the time, but because it was wrong then, we don't have to keep making it wrong. We need to modernize Jinx Street. I just hope that you will consider this and not pass the buck on it. It is confusing to every single person. Please do the right thing and just update this. If we need to change it to an E word, no problem, like Everett or Edward, it would be less confusing. I mean, I don't see any reason why it can't be changed. Uh, I would like a good explanation if it can't be changed. Uh, try to imagine if you had to repeat your address over and over, either on the phone or being somewhere and having to repeat it. it it's just, it just doesn't make any sense. Um, if I can volunteer to help in any way, I'd be happy to. You know, uh, must this just be set in stone to have it this way? We seem to be able to have a proposal for monuments. Why not have a proposal for a street sign? You find this up, Ms. Harris. Okay. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Karen Fiorio. Hello, my name is Karen Fiorio, and I live at 713 East E. Janet, Miss Janet and I are neighbors. Well, I've been here seven years, and I never honestly thought to have the street name changed. I would say it's very, I'm not saying I'm against it, just when she, I, it's, it is very confusing living there, besides the fact that the sign itself says street, when you're typing it in, well, I get enough from Amazon, they know where I am. <laughs> But when you're typing it in, depending on what website you're on, like Google Maps or iPhone Maps, whatever the heck that is, if they put street or ab, it can take you to a different spot. I've had children go through all the school systems, so I've had multiple parents trying to come to pick up kids and they can't find us. They're knocking on doors on different streets because they can't find it. And if someone wants to come and pick up my child, I want them to be able to get there to get my child to take them. But no, just, it is very confusing. People don't understand. You tell them a thousand times, E, E, yes, it's two letters, and they, they change it. They don't believe us. They take off an E, and they just write one E. And then our mail is delayed, and it goes to three streets over, and it's just, yes, it does get confusing. So, and I like East Eden. <laughs> <laughs> That's all. Thank you. Thank you. Robert Bell? I actually didn't have any comment on the UDL. My comment was on, on item seven and eight. So. Okay. 
And Pat McCarty, you don't have an item on here. Is Pat here? Pat McCarty? Did you want to speak on this agenda item? Okay. Did you just, did you just sign in to sign in? Yeah. Okay, thank you. <laughs> okay, thank you all for your comments. We're going to move to the... I can move to the next agenda item. Right? Next agenda item... Oh, Sorry. Item six. Yes. Unified Development Ordinance. The request recommendation of approval of the Unified Development Ordinance to repeal and replace the current Jinx code. Is there anything else that you want to add, Marseille? Anything else that the commissioners want to add? Can I just have a comment? Yes. First of all, thank you, Marseille, and everyone who worked on the UDO. It's a big step. Let me set aside the Ragland property for a minute and confusing street names. But, you know, I I think the zoning code had a place and a time, and I think it's long due for an overhaul. And this could be a big um, economic development to make things easier for Jenks. So I appreciate that it looks modern, that it's clear, that um, I know some of my clients, when they're looking at where to invest, will look at cities and when they have some crazy <laughs> rinky dink code, it's like, don't go there, it's just not worth it. And so I think this will have an tangible way to improve, improve things. But, um, it, you know, Jenks, I think is a great city. It does look a little bit disjointed now, and I think that's a product of kind of the zoning code that we've had. So I can't predict the future, but I hope that 30 years in the future, this will be a little more streamlined and consistent in a good way like this that leads to more development. So I, I'm excited about the, the UDO. So um, can I comment on the other two topics brought up? Uh, we mm -hmm. want to do that now. Or, sure. Um, the street name, I, the chair, or say that's not up for, we don't have the power to do that right now. There's a process to do that. It sounds like it needs to be changed. I mean, I. <laughs> I kind of like East of Eden, you know, it's a good <laughs> sign of the book, um, sounds cool, um, but that's just my opinion. Um, but I know like the post office does that, but I, I suggest you contact city staff and they can tell you more how to do that properly. We, we don't have the power right here to do that. It's not on the agenda. We don't, we don't set street names unless they're part of some new development. And I think even before that, there's a process to do it. So, you know, but point taken, but we can't. We can't do that now, if I understand everything correctly. Marce, is that right? Yes and no. Um, street naming is part of the UDO. And so I actually have been in contact um, with Ms. Pierce for over a year. We've had this ongoing dialogue. And she, I have spoken to staff. Um, the uh, members of staff that I've spoken to are not, do not show a lot of interest in changing the street name. I've also spoken to the postmaster and talked to him about the process of changing the name and the impact of that. If you wanted to um, entertain that thought, we could certainly uh, make it known to the um, city council. And it, it will go in the meeting minutes that this is one of the concerns brought up by citizens, and that is how we name our streets, and even to the point of changing the name. So it will definitely be moved on to um, City Council, you don't have to make a recommendation to change it, but um, I think Ms. Pierce will probably go to Council and and so the yes, the yes part is we here don't have the authority to do it, but we do have the authority to write the code in such a way that um, it could correct it. And it, um, I did ask Mrs. Pierce to come tonight and to speak. Um, because it was the best, most appropriate time to have the conversation because otherwise, unless she just came on a council night and talked about it um, in the portion of the meeting agenda where it says anything not on the agenda, she could have come during that time. But I ask her, um, she's been very patient with um, staff and, and we've gone back and forth for many, many, many emails and many months on. So there is a process. The biggest thing is the, even though we have two citizens here, 
there may be 200 along E Street that are not interested in changing the name of the street. And um, I know a lot of times I go in and correct addresses and it does not make people happy when you change their address for uh, many of the same reasons that she wants it changed and that is it could be considered a viable reason. Some people wouldn't want to change because they don't want the hassle of your credit card now has a, you know, where, where it says what is your your home address, whatever, your deliveries, your children's parties and everything. So you do have the authority to make a recommendation to consider it, to consider um, changing E Street or at least consider how um, to consider looking at the downtown and how the streets are named and if in fact we would ever want to entertain that. But I did ask her to come and speak tonight specifically on that. I probably should have given you all a heads up. I apologize. Yeah, just a quick comment on that particular issue as well. Uh, yeah, the UDO does address the need for us to upgrade our naming uh, so that there's more unique names. That's specifically what was pulled out in the UDO, and, and it is a time to do that. Um, but following Marseille's comments as well, besides the post office, besides the city, um, the impact, it's, uh, we have some uh, some city councilors present. Uh, we had a movement a few years ago just to uh, name a portion of the city Allen Trumbull Way. And that was going to impact everybody all the way down uh, that street, all the way from one end of Jinx to the other, which then becomes changes with your banks. Um, as Marseille said, credit cards, um, it, it, it has a, an overarching implication in a lot of areas. Uh, fire codes, uh, all of the, the 911 system, INCOG, all of that has to be updated. Um, so it, it's not just a, a simple matter of us saying we don't like that. Because I'm in the same situation. I live on first. Um, so do I get that question? Is it spelled out first? Is it fur? Um, so we, we run through that all the time. Um, empathetic to the situation, but it's not just a simple tap of the gavel, let's do it. Um, and we would probably want to have an open hearing with everybody impacted. I'd probably make that recommendation. So, anyway, just wanted to comment. David? Just to switch gears to, um, by, by the way, thank you for coming and speaking, and, and everyone who spoke on, I'll, I'll call, if it's okay, the Ragland property that you're referring to. Appreciate your service to Jenks over the years and donating property. Um, by the way, I, these views are not as a legal view. This is, I am an attorney, but this is just me as a commissioner. I, I don't see this as a taking, quite frankly. Um, I, I would be curious to see appraisals. I mean, I saw that you included this in here. Um, ideally, the idea, and not think about your property specifically, but I think downtown Jenks needs to be improved and can be and when done right this will increase the value of all the parcels now whether this particular parcel fits into a necessary riverfront district you know maybe i'm kind of torn it's very visible uh, that's which makes it a great spot for business and that's going to kind of set the tone for anyone driving in so i i know you're probably interested in making it look great as well um, you know, but I, I just don't really see this as a legal taking. I don't think rezoning does that and just counting up the number of uses because there's a lot of really odd uses in the current zoning code. There's like rope making. <laughs> I mean, it's so I, I, I would be curious to compare them and I have not done that. So I, it's probably more narrow somewhat would be my guess. But, okay. Um, but just to zoom out, I think tonight we're really looking at the UDO as a whole and this is kind of like all of Jenks and downtown is a big piece of that. So, I mean, we, we can talk more. I'm curious what the other commissioners think about the Raglan property, but um, I don't want that to stop kind of DDO, whether it applies to that or not. So, um, that's what I got. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments? I've got a, I'd like to get commissioners' uh, comments on the. Um, driveway ordinances. If you have a three or four car garage, is your driveway if the curb cut can only be the width of two? What do you guys think about that? That seems like it's going to create quite a hardship for a family 
mom and dad parking in the garage, a couple of kids behind them, you're, you're constantly shuffling cars, or they have to park in the street, is that to be enough to go to work? And, Kid didn't want to get a new car. <laughs> <laughs> Plus, um, back in any sort of boat trip, we're back in there. Um, you know, um, any, any type of trade, we're trying to enter from the street too wide and get over to the side of the house. Um, what do you guys think about that? I, I don't like it. I've got a three-car garage, and I kind of like having it. <laughs> I just can't go straight down, quite frankly, so I, I hadn't really considered it until you mentioned that. Yeah, well, I think it's proposed as the standard for new construction. Um, to wide and take the heat, but I guess even if you have a four car garage. I mean, I guess the idea is to get nicer grass and more greenway there, but yeah, it makes it a little dicey sometimes pulling into the last garage spot. So. It would be on, if you have, sorry, if you're looking at the boards, it's under development standards, and it would show you the sample of what that would look like. And I believe Jackie mentioned that um, one of the reasons is so that that children are not crossing, like if you're riding your bike or you're walking and you've got your child in your stroller or you're just, you're just out, whatever. Um, if I'm walking fr through my neighborhood on the sidewalk, I'm walking across a single lane of access rather than a curb cut that allows for three car widths. So it's a one car width. So that way I'm not watching for three cars backing out. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. There's a very specified space for that car to come in and out. And that, that was, I think, what she explained mm -hmm. as the yeah. reasoning behind it. The, one safety. of the reasons, yeah. It was a safety issue and uh, also about uh, uh, impervious surfaces, right. trying to reduce that for drainage purposes. And, uh, the uh, neighbor is engineered to handle that as far as we're on. So, so for this comment, like let's say we want to change that, notwithstanding that maybe other best practices are to have a narrower, you know, what, what's the process? You know, like would we tonight sort of approve it with a certain modifications or something, or, or would, would it go back through some public process? What, what are we looking at? We, we've talked about it a little bit, and I think what I would recommend is that you make um, any, any recommendations that you feel are, that need to be looked at further, and it would stay open to the public for comments. So there will be a, a period of time where we'll take the revisions or the recommended revisions and make them available to the public. And um, then if we go to the second public hearing in January, we would still have time to bring you back the changed draft if the, and, and have one more conversation at that time. How do you feel about that, Jackie? Yeah, it's definitely a, a it's definitely a good option. There is also the option to um, approve it upon uh, the condition of the, some specific changes. There, if we're really sure of what we want to change it to, if there's still a, a question as to what would be the best approach or exactly what those measurements should be, I think Marseille's uh, approach would be the best in order to work those things out. I, I would feel more comfortable with just giving you all time to, to take the comments, make the changes, put it out, and I'll just bring it back. It wouldn't be necessarily maybe um, if Jackie was available for that hearing, she could be available online to answer questions. But really, it would just be a document that shows the changes, the edited changes. And if, if you all feel very strongly about it tonight, and you just say, this is our recommendation, this is what we want, then that's what we put in there. And then the council makes the decision to keep it or to, to change it. Well, I have mixed feelings about changing what's already there because of the safety issue is a big deal and I know that when I've walked in neighborhoods before the garages the people that park outside some of their vehicles are so big the big trucks and the big suburbans and the big SUVs that are parked outside that if I was a mom with young kids and I was going down there and someone were were leaving I would be concerned if some, you have that much more space for a potential for an accident to happen versus having to to come down. Now, not having a big car, I don't know how difficult it is to go from over in the corner to the one side and then kind of redirect your car to come down 
on the area, and I don't know if that's so. I, it's just I could not do it. I could. I mean, I probably couldn't do it either. But I don't drive a big car. But I, I, you know, on the one hand, I look at this and I think that it's it keeps safety in 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 mind, and especially since these houses are probably going to be in an area where there's a neighborhood with a lot of houses right next to each other, will be some concern. And on the other hand, I hear what you're saying for being able to have a wider driveway, but I guess when it comes down to safety, is I agree with this because of the safety issue. One of the, um, uh, let me make one more comment. One of the changes to the subdivision regulations is that garages are set back five feet from the face of the house. So you can see that in every one of these diagrams, there's a setback. So we did gain five feet um, from the face of the house to the garage. So a half a car <laughs> is now no longer <laughs> impeding the sidewalk. It may be able to get, if you have two stacked there, you might be able to get it out of the sidewalk. I mean, we, we could, I think I would, um, if you do that, I'd like to make sure that we have other standards that spell out you cannot pave your entire yard. And the, like, so there's a couple of, there's multiple reasons why. Safety is probably the, the largest reason. Um, and how does that look to, I don't know, just I'd like, I probably will want to add some other language if we go that direction. That makes sense. Because we don't want someone having their entire yard paved. I, I kind of agree with the other commissioners and that single width can be somewhat restrictive. I don't know where that sweet spot is, if it's two widths or three. But I do think what I've seen is when you have a single width, what you end up is with people parking on the grass at times. And I think being on the setback of the house, it, it may be extremely challenging to you as a commissioner West and back people yeah. up. Just general comments on the development standards though, you know, I look at them and I think about how rising tides raise all boats. And so a lot of these standards really beautify the city, and I think that's worth noting positive value and also some developers do these improvements already right for example screening of mechanical units on rooftops you know, some developers already naturally do that because they, they know it lifts the standard of the building which probably helps them on the resale and so it's nice to see that there will be some consistency across some of these aesthetic things as well anyone else Okay. Do we have a yeah. motion? Uh, just a quick comment. Turn my mic back on. Um, I, I'd be concerned about us piecemealing the UDO. Um, and if there's concerns about sections of it, do we do we try to press it through tonight? Or do we try to bring them back to council? Maybe with the exceptions that we've talked about. Um, I know I've had some conversations, just so the rest of the commissioners know, um, had some concerns that specifically in the downtown district about oversaturation uh, because we had not addressed that yet. And I'm not really clear yet on language on how we can address that properly without hurting ourselves in other areas. Oversaturation, just to give you simple examples, um, I don't know how many of you have been in the community for how long, but uh, if you go back in the 80s and you came to Tulsa, if you were looking for a used car, that was 11th Street. Um, if you were looking for a pawn shop, that was Admiral. Um, and the, the loss or the lack of language on oversaturation, if we don't address it, then it's a roll of the dice of what actually comes into the area that we're trying to protect for our greatest development for the downtown area. So I, I would like to see us have some language on that. Again, I don't have recommendation right now. I've, I've pondered it for the past uh, two weeks as to what that language would look like based upon the structure of the, the UDO. Um, I'm not clear on that. I think we've done a great job on the, the language to make sure that the spaces that will be used will be used for retail uh, versus office space. So that, that helps uh, drive revenue uh, tax revenue in the area again that we're trying to 
protect as well as providing a mix of services for the residents and the, the whole concept of walking district uh, districts. Um, but I do have concern about the language on that. Just one other quick comment, just as a point of reference, so that I'm on the record on it. I, I know that uh, there's a lot of language that we had to put in here regarding medical marijuana. Um, and the, uh, of course, there's a lot of concerns on the legalities of it because of the way the statutes are currently written. In the UDO, there's a lot of language, uh, good defensible language on adult types of businesses, explaining why we can exclude those out, but not medical marijuana. And one of the areas that I would have concerns about over, over saturation right now in our downtown district, we already have two facilities, three, sorry, that would fall within that corridor. Um, and I know that some cities have uh, utilized some oversaturation language to limit the numbers, numbers of types of businesses like that. Uh, so it's just it's just a concern that we that we make sure that we're developing in a way that is going to be beneficial to the community. With regard to the Raglan uh, property, I would like I don't know Marseille, have you had a chance to look through this list of prohibited uses compared to the? Is the list? No, I have looked at the code as it would be um, if it were adopted, and there's about 38 categories because they're not uses anymore. They're categories, and there's about 38 that would be allowed by right in a CG, and about 18 that are allowed just absolutely straight up in um, RTC. Some of those uses that would not be allowed. Um, are they clearly prohibited rights. or are they can they be approved by um, where we had this special I'll go through it with you. Um, residential you. above ground if in the arts so I'm going to tell you if I read it it's allowed by right in the commercial general if and then I'll tell you what you would have to do in the RTC so if they wanted something and again, this is the RTC district yes so I'm going to um, residential above ground would require a special exception. A convenience store would not be allowed at all. A general retail of 50,000 square feet or more would require a specific use permit. A multi-tenant shopping center would not be allowed. An acute care center would not be allowed. A commercial animal boarding would not be allowed. General services greater than 50,000 square feet would require a specific use permit. A medical or dental office would require a specific use permit. A professional office would require a specific use permit. A professional office above the ground would be a special exception. A restaurant, which is a delivery or carry out, would be a specific use permit. General entertainment of more than 50,000 square feet would require a specific use permit. A car wash, fuel cells, gasoline station, or service station would not be allowed. A medical marijuana dispensary would re require a specific use permit, and a donation drop box would not be allowed. So those are the things that she could do straight up in a general commercial general. A lot of those uses, um, anything over 50,000 feet uh, on a ground floor is not probably going to happen because of the encumbrances already on the right. The lot, the plat, it is platted. There is no access allowed on main. Um, it's not wholly an agenda item, so I don't want to go into any more of it. But when you're comparing CG to RTC, what I just read are the uses that would not be allowed or would be allowed only through special exception or specific use permit. Everything else is allowed. So then from a practical standpoint, Typically, when we are approving specific use permits or new uses of vacant property, one of the things that we are looking at is what's proposed, whether or not it's going to be consistent and harmonized with the rest of the area. So if I take, for example, where you said a car wash would be prohibited, we've all approved several car washes with, with this commission, and that location would not be conducive to a car wash based upon the location. Um, I don't know, a gas station? I think um, the, the river 
front tourist commercial is designed to be um, retail sales, right. entertainment, and um, general retail. So what we want there is something that's walkable, something that's connected. It's not auto-oriented. I want to be able, now in this particular case, you're transitioning. So this is, is I would agree, a very transitional area. So you have the, the riverfront, and then you have the aquarium area, and then you have the mall area. And that's all that's in it right now. So in order to connect the north to the south, you, you have to keep following the dots. And in that area, we want a consistent style, we want a consistent feel, we want the same types of services all along there. So we're really, we, what we would not want um, near the aquarium, we would not want anywhere else along the river. We don't want a car wash near the aquarium, nor do we want it near the river walk. We don't want um, a, a gasoline station near the aquarium, nor do we want it on the river walk. Those are services and things that we do not think fit anywhere near the river, and we are not proposing to allow them. Probably an animal boarding, although we have an aquarium with lots of animals <laughs> boarded, probably wouldn't be allowed. So I, I guess I guess my question is, looking at the items that were itemized out that are prohibited, um, Chick-fil-A, Panera, would those be? It um, seems to me like those would be retail that we would. They would. We don't. I don't feel like the list is relevant because we don't have those uses anymore. Right. And naming something specifically is not relevant to the conversation. So along the riverfront, we're but looking. But a coffee shop would be acceptable. A coffee shop, but not a drive-through. But not a drive-through. We don't want automobiles racing in right. and out of lots along the river. Period. We don't want stacking issues along Main, along 9th Street, along B Street. We don't want stacking issues within our riverfront. And that um, those stacking issues, the traffic issues, the um, those types of uses are not what we're looking for. And um, we would not be supportive of those uses. So a Panera without a drive-through? Sure. Panera with a drive-through? No. Thank you. Or we would say a uh, general retail less than 10,000 square feet. <laughs> okay. Anyone else? I haven't looked that way in a while. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well stated. Anyone else? Anyone want to make a motion today? I'll just make, uh, I'll make one more comment. I think that um, I can put a window of two weeks. We'll say, I'll say till the end of the year, so that's a little teeny bit over two weeks, <laughs> but knowing that we have a lot of holidays. If there, you can approve it tonight um, per, as presented, along with any public comments and um, commissioner um, comments, and then they will be sent out to the council and um, that will be part of our public hearing and if you want to see you can also request that you hear you see it the final document in i mean you don't have to request it i'll bring you the final document at the first planning commission in january does that make it easier Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll move to um, approve, uh, just to clarify which numbers, you know, <laughs> Unified Development Ordinance. We're on number six. Number six <laughs> on the agenda, uh, as presented, with public comments, with the commissioner's Five, comments, Sorry. Um, subject to you know, seeing the final document. Um, Yes. Scott West? Yes. Terry Coleman? Yes. David Randolph? 
Yes. Carolyn. Yes. Next item on the agenda is zone change. This is to approve a zone change to the downtown core for part of Main Street between the railroad tracks and 7th Street. Um, I'll make a quick comment. In the rezoning of property that is not owned by the city, state statute does allow for the municipality to rezone property. It does not require any type of notice. I felt like from a um, planning uh, perspective, I it does require being published in the paper. It doesn't require letters to be sent out. I thought from a planning perspective, if I were in that boat, I would not want that to be the case for me. I did send out letters to everyone and notify them if they are within the downtown core and within the river uh, tourist commercial area. So we went above and beyond the requirements uh, that state statute gave us. And we did, we did notice everyone within those boundaries. So the downtown core is bordered on the west by the railroad tracks and on the north by A Street and on the south by Aquarium Place and on the east by um, Seventh. Any other any questions from the com any comments from the commissioners? I thought I have one person in the audience that's wishing to speak on behalf of this item, Robert Bell. My name is Robert Bell, one zero one one West G Street. Chairman, members of the commission, thank you for letting me speak. I I. You know me, I don't comment on zoning cases or, 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 or those kinds of issues, and I don't want to be a part of that. And, and I didn't do any analysis because I didn't want an opinion on any of this. But I do have a concern, and, and that is, is a police power zoning action and, and nothing on our books, nothing in our policies that restrict our abilities to do that at, at that point. And, that, and, and that's, why, that, that's why I'm here and that's why I came up. Um, I've been a planner for over 35 years. And, and I had to look, when I read this, notice that I somebody gave me I had to look this up to see if this was even legal at that point and I agree it is legal it, it can be done but I've never seen it done not in Tulsa not in Bixby not in Broken Arrow not in Oregon where I was a planner for for 10 years and and, and anywhere I and I think it could violate the trust that the community has in the planning program um, uh, of, of this community. And, and I say that because, I mean, for 20 years I've told people that we're in charge of the, of the comprehensive plan. And, and that's what the city sets in motion to say that's what it should be that's how it should develop but you're the owner of the property and only you can apply for that zone change uh, that, that's not true <laughs> and, and, and 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 it's never been done before tonight that that the city could say no we're going to change the zone whether you like it or not. At that point, you don't have any say in this 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 matter. Matter at that point. That uh, and my concern with that is is where does this go? Um, we all know each other, and and and, and there's and and I realize the issue here is is we've adopted a new comprehensive plan. And we want to 
put it into motion, and the way to put that into motion, the way they designed it is, is let's get these areas zoned to comply with that at that point. Uh, and I think that's positive, and I hear my three minutes is up, and I'll yes. try to be quick, but. <laughs> I, I think there's, uh, I think this planning commission needs to set a policy on themselves. I think it could be followed up by the city council. Looks like you please turn that off. And I'll say, I don't know if you want me to say, I don't know if you're no, I actually want to hear what he said yeah. more say, so I apologize for. No, that's my, fine. I mean, he's been here forever, so. Yeah. I kind of do want to hear as long as, and that's the first time I've ever said that wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. Thank you. But. Uh, and, 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 I, and, I, and I'll be quick. Um, I, 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 I think, as I was going to say, we'll all be gone someday. But what precedence is this setting? What says that the planning commission can't change the zoning on a piece of property just because the city doesn't want somebody to develop it a certain way at, at, at some point? And that's the risk we run. And, 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 and to do a police power zoning change with, without some sort of structure to it concerns me and that's why I'm here uh, and and so I I'm try I tried to think of what did I ever get close to this and I, I would say yes and I got close to it in the fact in the annexations because you've got problems in neighborhoods that were had to be annexed in as agricultural and, and 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 they should have been annexed in as residential. Well, I annexed in lots related to what they were that what they were used, and that was in Gregory Circle. The lots in Gregory Circle, I annexed them in as an RS1 lot instead of agriculture because I knew of the problems down south. I don't think this action should be used to fix that neighborhood that's agriculture and, and, and change to residential. But I think this action could be used to annex lots that are related in association with what they are and what they're used as. So that could be a part of that policy at that point. That, that could be a, a, a problem solver in the future related to annexations. I think that if you adopt this zone rtc related to the, the new comp plan and the and the periodic review of the comprehensive plan and that's what this was i think that policy ought to say that the only time that you can use police powers to change uh, an individual's personal property the zoning is to uh, associate with a periodic review of the comprehensive plan at least that puts some limitations on on the, on the government okay. thanks mr bell can i ask you a question yes yes yeah, so so from the standpoint that this is not an ad hoc process and if we look back the last time the comprehensive plan was amended was 20 years ago no i changed it in 2015 2015 okay um and and going back to the code the ordinances uh what's the date that we've gone back to their original draft, back to the 70s, 72. 72. Yeah, so so from this the standpoint, you're talking about a, you know, 50 years that, that we've been Well, well we, have to, we updated the zoning code in 2011 or 12. Well, there's a difference between an update thing. and a major rewrite. So, so I, here's my, here's my I, I question. Agree. So here's my question to you as a planner and with respect to uh, your years of, years of experience on this, um, clearly, this is not a police action from the standpoint that the state legislature put into law the provision where municipalities can do this where it's needed. If we need to be, if we need to establish a process to hold ourselves to a higher standard, other than the fact that the community has been involved with the UDO process and the comprehensive plan over a two-year period, where we've had 
you know, several open meetings and invited people to come in and, and provide feedback. What would you propose to the commission and to the city council as a process that we could codify that would hold us to a higher standard in order to ensure that what we have in ordinances is unified with our comprehensive plan? Can you come back with a proposal of what that process would look like? Uh, I, I could, and I'd be happy to, if, if staff wanted me to help them work. My issue was is that that you, you say state statutes specifically wrote uh, that power to us, but that wasn't something that, that uh, and I'd ask Marseille, have you ever seen it used? Uh, uh, have, I have never used it. Uh, are, are you concerned that city can change somebody's zoning on their piece of property with, without a, an application and without consent of that owner? If there had not been a public notice, if there had not been a public hearing, then I would have a problem with it. But we did do a public notice. We did go above and beyond. This is a public hearing. They were allowed and invited to come and to speak, which is why Ms. Ragland is here because she received a notice. State statute would allow me to do it without all of that. I don't feel like it is a police power or a taking. I do not prefer I, and it. I don't want to talk about. I don't want to talk about well, the right on the proper, property. Don't, don't I, use I, the I, police power or taking because it's not. I'm not talking about a taking. It's definitely a. It's definitely a. a it, it's related to a police power by definition by the state statutes. I and, and, do not and, like messing with other people's property. It is very ironic that I am a city planner because I don't want to tell people what they can do. Uh, all but I'm in this all case, I'm this is an alignment between the comprehensive plan and the UDO. When House Levine actually made the recommendation, the recommendation was to rezone the entire city. I lost my wig. I was like, never. We will never do that. We are not going to do that. We don't do that in Oklahoma. We're not. So we talked through it. We looked at everything we looked at the different sub areas it makes sense to change the zoning in the downtown core and along the river and, and, i do and, i'm and, not the kind of planner i'm not bringing you cases i've in two years i have not in four years before that at bixby i did not in four years before that i never once recommended it this is one time i'm not bringing you an application it's not what i do it's not how i do planning I don't think this planning commission has an issue or needs any other ordinances or any other codes to tell them not to do it. That's my opinion and they can listen to you and they can take whatever recommendation that you have, but I don't see this being a policing issue or whatever language you want to use. This is a one time ask. I, and, and I appreciate that and I agree that this action you know, is probably the only action that you could accomplish your goals uh, on your new comp plan. I, I, I don't disagree with that. Okay, Robert, and, you've gone way over your time and so I know you have another opportunity. I, to my, come my recommendation is, is that to do this action, I think there ought to be a policy in place. To Again, bring us a recommendation. Thank you. Yeah. Can I comment on that? Absolutely. This was a very long public process and this is not us pushing through something i mean i, right. I think yeah. any <laughs> two years worth that's right years. i mean there, there were lots of different bodies which did not involve me or many of the planning commissioners that helped put this together i mean we're getting best practices i mean we clearly need the, the zoning code you know was updated i appreciate your help updating it at times it just seems like it's definitely time to, to, you know, overhaul this. There were public workshops. People were invited right. to send in emails, and, add on things onto the map. So this is, I mean, this has been a participatory, participative process, collaborative process all along the way. And, and this implements the first part of the comprehensive plan, which was sort of overreaching goals that sounded good. But I mean, these are kind of the nuts and bolts to make that happen. So I don't want to just kind of throw the whole thing out. Yeah. <laughs> now if we spent all that brain damage kind of coming up with the first part, you know. Um, so I, uh, 
Yeah, I, I see your point, that, you know, but there's real value to a city to having a moderate zoning code. Um, that, yep. that's my Change is hard. Thank you. Very well said. Any other comments? Do we hear a motion? Are we on item seven? Yes. Okay. <laughs> I make a motion that we approve item seven as proposed with the zone change for the downtown core. I'll second. Jeffrey Byer? Yes. John Brown? Yes. Scott West? Yes. Terry Goldman? Yes. Dan Randolph? Yes. Chairman? Yes. Next item in the agenda is for a zone change. This is to approve a zone change to the riverfront tourist commercial for certain areas adjacent to the Arkansas River and near the Main Street Bridge. Comments? I, I am sensitive to um, the Ragland property. And I don't like how I feel about this is that it seems like it is really part of that river district, just me thinking about it. Um, and I realize you probably disagree with that. <laughs> but well, and, well, and duly noted, and it kind of pains me to view that, but I want to be honest, I, you know, I, it seems kind of wrong to start carving, and that's a big piece in my mind, and I'll probably lose some support over that. <laughs> no, I, <laughs> that's, that's, that's my honest view. But, um, I, I, having said that, I think there are plenty of very valuable uses that that property could do. I, I also think it's a little bit challenging for ingress and egress there. I mean, it would be hard to fit in. We I mean, mentioned the stacking and coffee shops. So, like, I, you know, I don't think it's taking. I think there's real challenges with developing it with any sort of commercial type thing. And it seems like it's part of the Riverfront District and it has plenty of value to do that. So, uh, I. Uh, I'm curious what others think, but I'm not inclined to uh, exclude it. I agree. Anyone else? I have um, four people that signed up to speak on this agenda item. If there is something in addition that you want to say that's not repetitive of what you've already mentioned and, and when we were on the previous agenda item, you're welcome to come forward and uh, give us your three minutes. i will need a name again, please. My name is Stephen Gray. Uh, I am an attorney in Brooklyn, Nara. Yami Saglas and Shkodi Gavarish. Sorry. His wife is a Russian. Yeah. yeah, I have no idea what you're saying. In, in your time We're world. old acquaintances. I don't understand what you're saying. Okay. In any event, one of the things that I want to bring out is with regard to the statement about citizen participation over the last two years. I would remind you that we had COVID and that we were severely limited from any type of meetings. I even came down with COVID. Number two, uh, I've heard no presentation whatsoever that there was any economic analysis of the impact of these zoning changes on any of the properties that are going to be changed. None. I've heard a lot of flowery talk about what we want for the city, which is great. But I haven't heard any nuts and bolts about economically how this is going to impact these properties. There has been nothing. Mrs. Bender has supplied you a broker owner's value opinion by a very well respected broker who said that if this zoning change happens, it's going to knock her property from 800,000 for a listing, maybe down to 400,000. So, Mr. Randolph, I respectfully disagree with your statement about a taking. And I will tell you, I've handled over a thousand eminent domain actions all over the state of Oklahoma. And I respect, I respect you tremendously because you're a very fine attorney, but I do disagree with your conclusion. There may be a halfway point, Ms. Hilton, of possibly working out something uh, on this particular piece of property. I understand wanting to move forward in the community's change, needs change. Uh, and I'm just asking again if there's possibility of meeting with Mrs. Bender to maybe try to come up with uh, something that could be a win-win situation for everybody. And so I would respectfully ask this council uh, planning commission to consider it. Thank you. I'll take any questions. Like, like what sort of 
foundation are, are you thinking? And we can be creative here, right? No, no, I, you, yeah. David, I, and that's a great thing about lawyers. We are always trying to find a creative legal solution. At this point, I'm not fully prepped to address that in three minutes or less before I, I get jingle jangled at Christmas time. But that is something that uh, I'd rather sit down and work something out rather than go to court because nobody wins when you get to court. I mean, everybody loses. And the last thing this community needs is lawsuits. So can I also ask, I mean, are you aware of a case uh, where a new comprehensive plan and zoning code was considered a taking in Oklahoma? I mean, I, I, I am aware, question, I, I'm not. You know, I'm aware of cases where there has been changes to zoning that are reported decisions at OSC.net uh, that the uh, cities, Oklahoma City and some other cities were tagged for that. I mean, zoning is always a hot button issue. Uh, it I'm is. curious about sort of done in a, a broad way. Um, it, you're talking a regulatory taking type situation. And regulatory takings involve all sorts of fact situations. And the Supreme Court of the United States has gone all over the board on regulatory takings. And they're getting tighter and tighter on what they're allowing governments to do and not do. And with regard to what Mr. Bell was trying to say, for instance, zoning is a police power of a municipality. It's not the police. It's just considered a police power that has nothing to do with law enforcement, uh, per se, of a police department. I'm just saying, I think, I'm just asking the opportunity to sit down and try to find something that can make a win-win situation for everyone, for the vendors and for the raggeds. Yeah, I, I, I would be very curious to kind of hear a real proposal later. I'm not putting you on the spot now. I would as well. Yeah. Sure, and, and that's fair. I, I don't disagree with that. Did I bust my three minutes? You did. I turned it off. <laughs> okay. well, what I do want you to understand is for an entire year, we met probably 30 or 40 times as a community to go over this. For an entire year. We had meetings after meetings after meetings. We had the aquarium three or four times. We had what's it, Spain what's Ranch. Brainstorming sessions. We had brainstorming sessions. We had meetings in here. It was it was we had past houses too. It this was started not, pre COVID. Yeah, that's right. It, it, it was not just three or four of us, it was hundreds of us together, and it was publicized everywhere in Jinx. So what happened is COVID hit, but during COVID is when they wrote this thing. It's not, it, they took all our stuff in what, 2019 and, and took it from us. We had meetings after meetings, so it was not something that was just hush hush. So, and I, did not mean, I did not mean to imply that Commissioner Bowman uh, whatsoever. I'm just, uh, but I do appreciate you enlightening me. I came, got brought into this uh, several days ago, and I've only been working on this for the last several days. And I understand that. I just want you to know this, is, this has been going on for three years, and it's, Believe me, we were at so many, so many meetings, it was a lot. Well, well, what I would appreciate if we could have a little more effort to maybe work something out. Yes, we heard you. Yep, we heard you. Thank you. Okay. Am I done? <laughs> Am I, do I have a quick quick uh, <laughs> coming off the stage? for someone to share this information with me. Um, I had um, a land purchase agreement in 2018 and the city made it very difficult and that buyer walked away. Um, I reached out to Ms. Hilton in May of 2020 with no response. I finally got her on the phone. So I've made opportunities. I have made, made myself available. People know that I own the land, that we own the land. And no one has come to me about any of this. I was not asked to be involved in a study. I was not asked my opinion. Zero. And the only way I found out about this was the day before Thanksgiving in a notice that we got in the mail. And I also have emails with Brandon that we got taken off the list somehow. And it took me several months to get my mom back on the list to get the public hearing notices. So in the, in the term of, of COVID and a pandemic and burying my father, 
um, we've been a little busy and there's been several outreaches from myself and I have not had that reciprocated. So I just wanted to make sure that was one on record. Thank you. Yes, that's Madam it from Chair. the floor, right? Everyone, the floor is closed. I just had one comment and um, the spender was in a meeting earlier today and I did make it um, very clear that if she has an application or she has something that would like to go in there, we have a planned unit development process and we can entertain things, um, probably not a dog boarding or car wash or something like that. If it's permitted um, or a special exception, et cetera, we can go through the planned unit development process. I am more than happy to work with her. I don't think that we have to exclude it from the RTC um, district because I think that we can work with her. I do not believe that um, it would be easy or viable to do any type of drive through. I think if you're going to um, think about the entire river district and properties along there, that that is just something that I would argue is not something that we want. So that's probably the biggest um, issue is whether or not we would want um, if all the properties stayed exactly as they are today, do you want drive throughs in there? I think there are um, maybe multi tenant shopping center, probably is not allowed right now, could be allowed. It's not really something that we want all along. Like if, if the um, OAF were to ever sell or something, it's not really the look or feel that we really want in that area. But we could at least talk about it. I'm happy to meet with Ms. Bender, but I personally would not recommend taking it out of the RTC. And I am happy to work with her or any other um, owners of property within the downtown core or within the um, anywhere in, in the city. There's usually a creative solution to getting um, to getting a project into the city. We spend hours and hours talking to clients and to owners and their um, potential buyers and sellers and, and trying to get them a project. Sometimes, as you know, we approve projects and they cannot be built. They just physically cannot be built. The land will not allow it. There's not enough room for the parking. There's not enough room. Sometimes that happens. I might be able to, I might say, look, let's change this tonight to a multi-tenant shopping center to be allowed. But <coughs> yeah. There may be parcels along the riverfront where it just can't be built because there's not enough land area to, to accomplish the goals of that. If you decided tonight to include drive through, don't recommend it, but you could, you could. Um, there are parcels that it would not be viable to do a drive through for safety reasons for um, for reasons of just land configuration. There's some lots that just don't lend themselves to those types of uses. So if a viable use came and that was the, the thing, then we can go through that process at that time. We do it all the time. Just, just an observation. I, I think a process with the PUD could be the way to reach some sort of solution here. Uh, you know, if you look, just an observation, you know, if you look back at what we've gone through, it's, it's fairly rare that we push back on PUDs, and when we do, it seems like there's a pretty good reason not to. So I'm not saying we're just to prove anything. That, that, that is sometimes the criticism, you know, the city gets is oh, just anything goes through. But <laughs> I don't think that's true at all. Um, but I think we're very accommodating to consider things and reach a solution. So I, you know, personally, that's kind of what I I'd like to see. Um, and there's flexibility on that point. But that's just my observation. Okay. Anyone else? I agree completely. That's why the PUD process exists. Just yeah. compromise and give and take. It's, it's already there. We don't need something else. Yeah. I agree. I agree. Do I hear a motion? I move to approve item 8. I'll second. Jeffrey Meyer? Yes. John Brown? 
Yes. Scott West? Yes. Craig Bowman? Yes. Dave Randolph? Yes. Gentlemen? Yes. That concludes our agenda items. Any planning updates for us, Marseille? The, um, we'll still be taking public comments through the end of the year, and we'll put all of those comments together, and um, I'll bring you back that, that document. It'll go, I think I'll send public comments to the Unified Development Ordinance Committee. They can evaluate them and make recommendations based on those comments, and then we'll bring it back um, to the first meeting in January, January 6th. And then it'll go to council, um, hopefully, depending, but hopefully that. Just remember, you are a recommending body, and um, that just because we, just because you all make recommendations, just because I make comments, does not mean they will or will not be approved at council. Council has the final authority and the final say, and they may or may not approve what we've said. That's true. Okay. You hear a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. All right.